well, I don't actually need to do much of a welcome. Um, by now, you all are getting used to these, our optional pack topics. I will remind folks, though, if you think of specific topics or, or initiatives or programs or pro projects we've got going on that you would like a deeper dive into, let Catherine Webb Martinez know or let me know, and uh, we will start seeing who uh, might be able to provide that to you. Because you know, one of the things about you providing your wonderful volunteer service to us is I want to make sure that we provide uh, equal value back to you. And it seems like giving you access to this type of deep dive into topics hopefully is of value. You guys keep coming back. And I will remind you, too, that all of these are recorded for your use only. We do not make these recordings available to the public. And partially that's because we want you all to feel comfortable asking questions, having conversations amongst yourself, won't be going out to the public. And we do have a library of previous episodes for any of those you may have missed. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce Ruth Dahlquist Willard, who uh, very graciously took on an enormous task a few months ago. Uh, to serve as our interim director for UC Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program, SEREP. Um, and she's been doing an amazing job of not only looking at SEREP itself, but bringing into it some of our other programs that are a good fit and helping find the synergies and the opportunities for collaboration there that I think ultimately is going to enable us us a and r and Sarah and those programs to better serve our mission so with that ruth why don't you and i ruth i i do want to emphasize this is still a work in progress uh so so ruth hasn't figured it all out yet but she's <laughs> working with all of us and with you and with folks out in the field to really figure out how to make this work best so ruth i myself i'm looking forward to a, to a, a a status check too on where you're at <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Glenda. Thank you for inviting me. And I also would welcome everyone's comments on the process, as Glenda said, as it's still a work in progress. And certainly all the input we can get is great. I'm going to share my screen and start PowerPoint. Can everyone see that? Looks good. All right. So as Glenda said, I became the interim director of SEREP, um, I guess it was last July. And so um, at that point, a and uh, decided to move two additional programs into SEREP to make a larger, more integrated statewide program, which are the Master Food Preservers, um, which had formerly been in the, uh, the nutrition, community health and nutrition programs, and before that were in the Master Gardeners, and then the Small Farms Network, and we had had a statewide program in the past for small farms, and then it had Kind of grown back to the point where it needed more administrative support so it kind of made sense for multiple reasons um, as well as the opportunities that this provides to, um, to put these programs together and see what kind of synergy and collaboration uh, could come out of it so uh, some of the goals um, in restructuring SEREP um, and expanding it in this way um, one of the things that I think it will allow us to do that's very interesting to me is to really look across the whole food supply chain or food system and see how we can make impacts from production on farm practices to uh, processing, maybe small scale processing for food businesses or um, unique uh, niche crops or um, drought tolerant crops, for example, and then to the marketing side. So by combining these three programs, we're actually hitting all three points here on the food supply chain and looking at the intersections between them. Uh, we also have this opportunity to get more integration of our statewide and county-based programs. So um, SEREP in the past has been more of a, a program based in Davis that has had collaborations in counties, but hasn't had um, dedicated staff or programs in counties. And now with the addition of Master Food Preservers and the Small Farms team, um, there will be direct connections to staff in the counties um, with uh, more opportunity for collaboration on on projects, grants, uh, collaborative activities. Um, and that also brings in the statewide support for master food preservers and small farms that um, that we didn't have in the past and that will now be possible under this um, new version of SEREP. Um, and so really the goal is to build a powerful new, newly improved, I guess, statewide unit 
um, that can really have the administrative support and structure to manage large amounts of funding. Um, we're kind of at a &R in the era of, of large grants, like $20 million here. And I forget the Regional Food Business Center's grant, how many million dollars that is. But, um, but we, we're getting these really big grants and we need the administrative and programmatic support to manage those and make sure we deliver on what we promised and that our work has the impacts that we wanna see um, and that it builds a &R up into a stronger institution. And then uh, secondly, um, and this is what I'll talk about more today, um, is to address major challenges to sustainability in California agriculture. Um, and Serap in the past has, um, it's gone through sort of different phases. It was started in the mid eighties um, and used to have more of a focus on um, on farm practices. It sort of morphed into more of a food systems program and now I think it's an opportunity to keep all that great food systems work and then bring back some of the production work as well. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some ideas for that in a bit. So here's the SEREP mission. This was established by the California legislature back in the mid eighties. Um, so the University of California established SEREP with three mandates. Um, one was to administer competitive grants for research on sustainable agricultural practices and systems. And so that's been brought back recently. Um, Glenda actually restarted that a few years ago and it's been very successful and popular. Actually, the current round just closed. And so we'll be reviewing um, grant applications for that um, pretty soon here um, to develop and distribute information through publications and on-farm demonstrations and to support long-term research in sustainable farming systems on UC farmlands. And that's one of the goals that I hope we'll be able to get back towards that goal of really doing research on sustainable practices. So currently here's the goals that UC Sarah has, um, access to food that is healthy for people on the planet, strong food systems, economic prosperity, an inclusive and equitable, equitable society, climate resilience and protecting natural resources through agroecology. And those are all tied to ANR's condition changes. And there's kind of these two arms of Sarah. One is called food and society. And that is really the strong food systems work of Sarah, um, taking, produce and products from the farm to uh, markets and to consumers, and a lot of work on food hubs, institutional procurement, aggregation, um, and looking at where food moves and how to um, how to really promote local food and um, sustainable practices through the food system. Um, there's that photo is from farm to school um, effort. Um, and then the other side of syrup has been the ag and environment side, um, looking mostly at soil health practices, soil conservation practices, and then um, putting biodiversity on farms. Uh, this is an example. And one of the things that they've ended up focusing a lot on on that side of syrup is elderberry, uh, which is a California native plant that can be put in hedgerows. Um, so it can provide benefits for pollinators and beneficial insects like predator, predators and parasitoids for biological control of pests. And then also um, syrup has been doing this work on could you also make value-added products out of it and, um, and get extra income for a farm? So for a small to medium scale diversified farm, that could be an interesting economic benefit of adding biodiversity. So that's that's been Serap's work, um, I would say over the past couple of decades. And then um, Master Food Preservers, um, I don't know how familiar everybody is with all these programs, so I'll just give a quick overview of each one. So the Master Food Preservers um, teach food preservation techniques at the county level. Um, all of their information is science-based and research-based. Um, and this is something that was interesting for me to learn about. Um, all their re recipes that they teach have to be peer reviewed and um, approved by um, UC colleagues. So mm -hmm. they, um, they administer their program locally in county offices um, in about 17 counties. And it's similar to Master Gardeners in that they volunteer and donate their time um, last year, there's over 400 Master Food Preserver volunteers and almost 19,000 volunteer hours. Um, this picture here is from Fresno. Um, I went to the Fresno Fungi Festival, which is a really fun event, and there's the Master Food Preservers um, with information on how to dry mushrooms. Um, so they do a lot of great public outreach and education. Um, and this is their mission, to keep Californians safe and well as they use culturally appropriate research-based practices to safely preserve preserve food in the home, reduce food waste, and increase food security, provide engaging ways for Californians to explore healthy food. 
So um, canning, jams, jellies, dehydrating, pickling, any food preservation method that has peer reviewed science behind it. And uh, we're looking into how they can expand into offering training on value added products and cottage food operations and maybe other um, things like micro enterprise home kitchens where there are policies in California that allow people to make food in their own kitchen at home and then sell it on a limited basis. Um, and if it follows certain rules and is on a list of foods that are unlikely to have major food safety concerns um, and to have spoilage issues. So that's Master Food Preservers. And then we've got the Small Farms Network, um, which has been growing over the past few years. And so, um, the mission of the Small Farms Group is to assist small scale and diversified family farms to thrive economically through extension support, bilingual and culturally relevant training, research on small acreage and emerging specialty crops and policy engagement. Um, that's part of our group up there at the Kearney Ag Center when we had a Small Farms Technology Expo uh, showcasing uh, appropriately scaled technologies for small farms as part of the F3 grant, which is another one of our large grants um, in the Fresno and Merced area focused on technology and innovation and economic development. And so um, the small farms advisors and staff um, really serve as an information hub that connects small scale farms and the kinds of farmers that might not be served by other programs might be falling through the cracks of commodity based or disciplinary based programs. Um, and making sure that they're also connected to the University of California resources. So that includes um, small scale and diversified family farms, beginning immigrant, refugee, and other underserved farmers. And there are specific populations in California that we've developed programs to focus on. In Fresno, we have a large Southeast Asian uh, refugee farmer community, as well as um, Spanish speaking farmers and the African American farmers of California. In Santa Clara, we have a large group of uh, Chinese immigrant farmers. And so throughout the state, there's these groups that we wanna make sure that they're connected and that they receive um, support in their own language um, and that they're supported to thrive economically. Um, we've recently gotten some large um, contracts from state agencies, from CDFA, the Department of Water Resources, uh, for example, um, that have allowed us to um, increase our staff in all of the counties we work in. And so uh, working with the small farms advisors and offering assistance with production issues, nutrient management, disease and pest management, irrigation management, um, regulatory compliance, such as food safety, um, groundwater regulations, labor and pesticide regulations, and then also offering application support for economic relief and incentives programs. Um, and so we have a large number of farmers that have been assisted by uh, those programs um, in recent years. And another thing included in the small farms work is research on unique small acreage specialty crops. And some of these you might have heard of before. Um, dragon fruit has been really promoted by Ramiro Lobo in San Diego County. Uh, Margaret Lloyd in Yolo, Sacramento and Solano counties is doing research on um, grafted heirloom tomatoes for disease resistance. Um, heirloom tomatoes might not be bred for disease resistance, but maybe grafting them onto a rootstock would increase their ability to withstand fusarium and ver verticillium and other um, common diseases on tomato. Um, in Fresno, we have a project with UC Riverside, um, working with a plant breeder there to develop um, aphid resistant varieties of Asian yard long bean or long bean uh, to reduce pesticide use and provide farmers with the uh, host plant resistance <laughs> mechanism to um, to manage that crop without having to spray for aphids. And then um, a Prana Gazula in Santa Clara County and then uh, my outgoing program in Fresno County have been working on water and fertilizer requirements for crops like garlic chives, moringa, lemongrass and bok choy. Um, and those important both for regulatory program compliance as well as best practices. Um, so trying to find information on crops that aren't, aren't always well studied and so taking all that um, into account, uh, we can look at how those programs were previously funded and how they're going to be supported under the new structure uh, that's currently still being uh, discussed and developed. Um, so it, previously, Sarah has relied, I would say, mostly on central funding from ANR as a statewide program and then also has been able to bring in additional grants. 
Um, the Small Farms Network, its current form is almost totally funded by um, agency contracts with right now over 8 million in contracts, um, as well as the Small Farms Advisors being centrally funded by a &R as um, academics. And then the Master Food Preservers have had uh, central funding for their statewide program activities. Um, and then the, the coordinators in the counties are usually paid for by the county itself, um, contributing to the county budget for those staff positions. And so hopefully we are gonna be developing a new structure for this program that's gonna be able to leverage these different funding sources and setups in an integrated way with central administrative and programmatic support provided to all these units for managing contracts and grants, financial oversight, helping with hiring, HR and business processes. We um, often, we need help with external communications. We're so busy that we don't have time to tell our story and so having communications staff is gonna be really important. Um, and then hopefully once we're able to manage these larger grants that are coming in, we can continue um, seeking funding from larger grants and maybe philanthropic donations as well to keep, keep the program really robust. And this is again, still evolving and still being discussed, but here's um, kind of a preliminary structure that's that's been developing as we talk about how these programs are gonna be integrated with SEREP and how they're gonna be collaborating with each other um, and cross-cutting themes that are emerging. And so this is kind of how I'm thinking about it right now. This, this may change, but um, currently this is the model we're playing with where we've got three kind of pillars within SEREP. Um, we've got a focus on sustainable production practices and that can include organic, regenerative, agroecological practices, um, we are also having discussions right now about potentially integrating the Organic Agriculture Institute into mm -hmm. this new structure. Um, and so, um, you know, how could we leverage that program with the other programs? What additional value would each of them bring to each other? And how could we work on bigger problem solving together across the whole food supply chain um, in a way that's more integrated? And so, um, so we've got Kind of the production practices pillar. We've got a small farms, which is sort of the bridge, I think, between the production practices and marketing, because um, it includes both, uh, really focused on niche or diversified production and also marketing. And then the food systems and food supply change, uh, food and society uh, side of Sarah combined with master food preservers really makes a pillar that focuses on everything that happens post-harvest or post-production. And so processing, marketing, uh, and all of those, um, you know, things like food hubs, institutional procurement uh, that are about finding great markets for locally produced and sustainably produced food. And after putting this together, I realized these are actually the three pillars of sustainability that kind of correspond to environmental, social, and economic sustainability. And I thought that was interesting and uh, maybe, maybe it could provide a helpful framework. And that's all supported by a central administrative business programmatic support unit that leverages the funds and helps manage um, projects across all of these programs. Looking at some potential collaborations, um, we've had three brainstorming sessions that um, have been with small farms, master food preservers, and the current SEREP team. And there's been uh, some ideas that have come out of those as we've thought about how to work together um, that's an ongoing conversation. We're also planning a, a larger retreat this spring where we'll meet in person and continue to brainstorm collaborations. But there's a natural connection between the small farms um, activities and the ag and environment side of SEREP with basically biodiversity on farm and uh, soil conservation practices. Um, and then with um, value added products that really unites all three with cottage foods or value added or small business support where um, the small farm might have a, an integrated um, business model where they're producing value-added products from their own farm. How do those get sold and marketed? Uh, and then what are the food safety considerations that master food preservers can help with um, in making sure that they're produced safely? Um, and identifying some shared priorities. Um, all of these three programs have very strong values for enhancing equity in the food system, for promoting local food, uh, promoting diversified farming systems and also enhancing food security. So I want to get back to the major challenges of sustainability and how could SEREP address some of these things. Um, 
And sometimes it's a little overwhelming to think about these. I live in Fresno and I'm actually doing this position based in Fresno. Um, and really we're kind of in a way ground zero for a lot of sustainability challenges here. Um, it's all around us. Um, I have this photo here of the snowpack because I, I grew up uh, about half an hour from Fresno. So I grew up looking at the mountains covered with snow in the winter. And it's just crazy to me that during my lifetime that snowpack is becoming less reliable um, and we've had several periods of prolonged drought. And we know that with um, winter temperatures rising, we might not have as reliable of a snowpack as we used to. We might have more rain and probably less predictable precipitation events um, as we saw last year when we had, I think it was 12 atmospheric rivers. So we could have, we could have no rain or we could have way too much rain and it might be more variable. Um, also wanted to just briefly mention, this is a new pest um, for Fresno County, not for California, but for Fresno County. So it's not a quarantine pest, but uh, never been found before in Fresno County. This is uh, the Mexican rice borer, which is um, a caterpillar that gets into the stems of lemongrass plants. Mm. Um, and Michael Yang basically um, found this when growers called him and said, we have a caterpillar on our lemongrass that we've never seen before. Um, and so we were able to take samples and get it identified and find out, um, you know, what the consequences of it being here were. Uh, but it's very likely, uh, we don't know this yet for sure, but um, it's native to Southern California and Mexico. And so it's probably increasing its range due to um, uh, temperatures going up and probably winters not being quite as cold as they used to be that would kill off um, this pests in this area. So, um, you know, trying to think about how syrup can address challenges like this. Um, here's one uh, that I've particularly been involved in. So this is on my mind. And so I thought I would use this as an example. Um, uh, we've got major groundwater overdraft in the San Joaquin Valley, as well as some other parts of the state. And the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, or SIGMA, was passed back in 2014 uh, to address that. Um, but we continue to have declining groundwater levels uh, and associated with that, we lose groundwater storage, we have subsidence, it can degrade water quality on the coast. You can have seawater intrusion as, as the groundwater is sucked uh, up that it comes in from the side, seawater comes in. Um, and there's equity issues here too, because um, small farms and disadvantaged communities with drinking water wells are particularly at risk from dropping groundwater levels. Um, you can see on a map here, these are the groundwater basins in California that have been identified as either high priority, medium priority, or critically overdrafted. Um, as we know, water in California is not for the faint of heart to work on. Lots of political conflict, both uh, current and historic. So if we look at a major sustainability, ch sustainability challenge like this, you know, what can this um, stronger expanded syrup uh, do to help with that? Um, and so one of the things I think is exciting to look at is um, drought tolerant crops. Um, all three programs have actually been working on um, some new and emerging uh, that are currently niche drought tolerant crops from California. The Master Food Preservers is very interested in developing recipes on uh, prickly pear cactus or nopales. And then Sarah has done all this work on elderberry, which is a, a drought tolerant California native plant. And then various small farms advisors have worked on moringa, which is a drought tolerant uh, a tropical shrub. Dragon fruit, jujube is a drought tolerant uh, tree that's grown in Fresno and Southern California and on the coast. Agave over on the coast as well. Coffee, you know what? I should have taken coffee off there. Sorry, it is not drought tolerant. That was from a previous presentation. Um, but the other ones uh, definitely I would consider to be drought tolerant crops. And so, if we look at these as niche crops uh, that can produce value-added products, those can be um, economically valuable to a small farm. The master food preservers can help with uh, food safety and process control for recipes for uh, products from these crops. And then we've also seen in the past how a, a crop that start, starts out on a small acreage can become larger, in the, like in the case of blueberries in California, which started as a small farms um, project. And so, um, if we look at how these programs might uh, contribute to this potential solution, um, if you are going to have a new crop, you need to figure out varieties, production practices. Um, so the small farms uh, advisors and staff can help with that. Master Food Preservers can develop training on processing methods, um, procedures for the Cottage Foods Act, permits. Um, 
We also have, um, I'll just briefly mention this large project in Fresno called F3 or Local Farm and Food Innovation um, that is really focused on economic development, small business support. Um, this side of it is working on um, marketing of local foods and value-added products. Um, and so research that's needed, for example, on consumer preferences, sensory evaluation, and then the Serap uh, food systems team can work on marketing, procurement, food hubs. How do these job tolerant crops and products that come from them get marketed? So I really see these programs as being able to work together to solve um, different aspects of, of a problem that um, really is integrated. Um, if we look at um, the overall problem of groundwater overdraft, um, you know, I talked about drought tolerant crops. That's just that first topic there involving master food preservers, small farms, and uh, the food and society side of syrup. We could also look at other solutions. Um, the small farms advisors, some are working on groundwater recharge um, and looking at doing that on small farms as well as in conjunction with soil health practices. It really relates to syrup's ag and environment side. Um, we are starting a new technical assistance program for the Sustainable Groundwater Man Management Act and small farms, um, as well as for uh, groundwater and irrigation water conservation. And so being able to locate that program within CEREP, um, which is why that CEREP admin button that appears there, um, really makes it stronger and more stable and uh, able to deliver on a statewide level. Um, and then I think also we have an opportunity within CEREP um, and being from the University of California to convene productive problem solving dialogues for, for collaboration and trying to work on these programs and problems together. Um, and that's a longer term project, but that's something that I'm personally very interested in. So um, I think I might be almost out of time here. I know it's almost 2.30. Um, I'll just try to finish up quickly, um, just relating this back to ANR's um, condition changes and the kinds of impacts we wanna see for economic prosperity, protecting natural resources, climate resilience, equity and inclusion. We can basically, much of this work relates to all those um, condition changes. And then um, another thing that I'm really excited about that's emerged from our brainstorming sessions is just the potential to build capacity both for master food preservers and the small farms teams, as well as external partners through the Startup Small Grants Program. Um, everybody is really excited about that. I would really like to expand that program with more funding. It's oversubscribed and um, the interest far exceeds the funding available. And so um, that's something that I'm gonna be looking at how I can um, find additional funding for that program uh, and help more partners um, address problems in their communities. And I uh, just wanted to mention also some additional new directions that have come out of discussions and are being talked about in addition to expanding the small grants program um, there's also with the F3 project in Fresno and Merced, the opportunity to try to develop small farm appropriate technology, um, especially for saving labor and for promoting sustainable production practices. Um, up there in the corner is a picture of a drone that can be used to uh, distribute beneficial insects. Um, the previous version of that distribution method was basically taking like a salt shaker type thing and going by hand down a row. And so, um, you know, how can technology make biological control more effective um, as a viable alternative to pesticides? Um, really want to engage with the large scale sustainability challenges like groundwater. And also I should mention the sustainable pest management roadmap and looking for really economically viable and sound alternatives to pesticides. Um, also trying to develop collaborations with other statewide programs within ANR. Uh, we currently have a, co a collaboration for small farms IPM with the UCIPM program, um, working with the California Institute for Water Resources on the Sigma Technical Assistance Program, and then exploring with community and health and nutrition um, ways to keep supporting the master food preservers, as well as there's some interest in a joint um, training and professional development on uh, disaster preparedness, risk management, um, that kind of seems to uh, be a theme across all of our programs. And then finally, um, there's some interesting new partnerships developing with other UC campuses. Um, the UC Santa Cruz Center for Agroecology um, has been doing a lot of stuff in parallel to CEREP as well as the small farms work. And we haven't totally connected and collaborated. We're hoping to collaborate more closely. 
Um, we also have partnerships with both UC Davis and UC Merced engineering departments developing for the appropriate technology piece for small farms. Um, potentially working with UC San Diego on efforts to map uh, certain types of farms in California. And then uh, we have a project scientist with the UC Berkeley Food Institute that now is part of SEREP as well, um, working on agricultural economics and agroecological transitions um, on, on farm practices. So that's, I know a lot of information. I think that's the end. Um, I think I'll stop sharing. Let's see if anyone has any questions or comments. I would love to hear your advice as we um, embark on this new, new journey of trying to revitalize and expand uh, syrup so that we can work on all these, all these issues. Well, I'll, I'll kick it off by just saying thank you, Ruth, and wow, you've uh, you've really accomplished a lot since the last time I saw one of those updates. <laughs> So uh, I'm very excited about it. And um, I see Sharon's got her hand up. I know. And please don't let me hog it because I have I have a whole page of questions. <laughs> which I might just have to reach out and, and do a separate conversation. But as opposed to trying to get into details, uh, you know, of many of the aspects that that you have offered, uh, I am more interested in how you are finding a balance between all of the particulars, the day-to-day -day particulars of all of these efforts and the big picture organization of trying to move this effort forward because it requires your vision to be able to bring other people on board, but it also needs your leadership to keep all of these individual efforts being productive. So if you can give a shot at that, I'd appreciate it. And we can talk about specifics down the road. Yeah, I appreciate that question. I would say that that is a developing process, <laughs> uh, partly because I am actually still holding down my small farms advisor job in Fresno until my replacement is hired. But we had a very good candidate pool for that and are doing final interviews uh, before the end of the month. And so um, I'm hopeful that um, that will ease the transition as well. And then um, also I'm very grateful that Glenda has been so supportive of this program and has allocated some new positions to Sarah that are also gonna help with, I think everybody's workload. I'm really excited to create a structure with career tracks um, that, uh, will help us retain our great staff um, and provide places for them to go and move up in the organization. And that that's all a work in progress. So I think Sharon, that's a question I kind of ask myself every day. <laughs> it's like, how, how's that all working? <laughs> but um, yeah, trying, I think part of it is through having conversations. Um, also, Kathy has been very supportive um, facilitating some of the brainstorming sessions. And I think that's been really key also for developing a shared vision um, and trying to, as we go forward, integrate these programs more and more, bring people together to talk to each other and get to know each other. Um, but I find it's very much a back and forth dialogue with people in each group about the larger vision. And could I just, just a quick add on, you talked about an upcoming uh, meeting where you're gonna bring folks together. Could you add a little bit more on that? Yeah, in April, we are gonna have, um, an in-person meeting with Master Food Preservers, uh, current team of Serif and small farms, and so that everybody can meet each other. And we'll do brainstorming then and strategic planning and try, like, I, I really see that as a visioning retreat as well, like trying to develop a shared vision around our work. What problems are we trying to solve together? What can we do together that's more effective than just on our own? Um, and not trying to force any integration where it doesn't make sense, but trying to figure out like where it does make sense and where we can help each other. Um, and you know, ANR is such a wonderful organization. There's so many great people that never get to meet each other. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's always nice when we can bring people together and they find out, oh, this person in San Diego is doing the same thing I'm trying to do in Ventura, or, you know. Um, so that's part of my goal as well, is to just bring people together and find um, where the where the synergy happens.
Glenda, if I could weigh in, I have a question for Ruth or more than a question, just a comment. <clears throat> Ruth, over the last 10 years, I've worked a, a, quite a bit on establishing food hubs across the state. And I'm very happy to hear about your continued emphasis on those programs. I recently co-authored a study for the Yellow Food Hub program where we've looked at aggregating small farmers for institutional buyers for local communities. When I'm talking about institutional buyers, I'm talking about schools, universities, <laughs> hospitals, prisons. And you helped me, Sarah co-hosted a workshop we had uh, last year in Yolo County. But I, I'd like to brainstorm more about that and how we can take best practices and collaborate across the state, because there are pockets of areas that we could do a better job of that. Mm -hmm. And the University of California, the state university systems all have these bi-local programs now. Mm -hmm. But by local means a 200 mile radius. I think we yeah. can do a 50 mile radius and do a better job because we produce so much throughout many different regions. So I, I really wanna pick your brain on that as you continue to develop your new system. I love it. So congratulations on, on kind of the new structure. Thank you. And yeah, we can definitely follow up and talk more. Um, I sort of feel like there are regional differences that are important to consider um, when trying to scale it up across the state. And maybe we can talk more about that, like Southern California versus Central California versus Northern California. Sometimes um, I think there's different solutions in different communities. Other comments and questions? Don't make um, me- Glenn. Hi, Glenda, it's Paula. Hey, Paula. Hi, just sitting in a car and trying to manage my mobile phone. So um, I only got part of the presentation, but thank you. Uh, it was really good to see it and to see all the work that's happening there. Um, I wanted to follow up on uh, a food hubs and lawn raised that question as well. But I think, as you probably know, there was a, a farm to community food hub bill a couple of years ago by Richard Bloom that funded food hubs. And SARAP was um, identified as a member of the advisory board. So I hope that's going forward. Just wanted to make sure we touched on that, but also, um, what you know, wondering how to tie the intention of that bill together with your efforts. It was funded at 15 million, but it keeps getting cut out of the budget whenever we have a deficit. Um, and then Community Alliance of Family Farmers fights hard to bring it back. So I'm just wondering if you might want to touch on that in terms of the larger strategy of advancing food hubs um, beyond technical support, but also just creating this big acceleration push to really get mm -hmm. the development money um, into place. And there's lots of USDA funds. Um, that's sort of the general nature of my question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm not sure if we're on that board. Um, I'll definitely check on that. Well, I, I believe you're designated to be on the board, um, but if you have not, I've just lost touch of what I'm supposed to look at here. In yeah, my, well, in my during, during the during the transition, that may have fallen through the cracks, so we'll definitely look into that. Yeah, take a look. Um, it's um, you. Sarah was designated as a member, and that was a big push there. So the bill is AB 1009. So um, just something to have on your radar, but not just that piece, but you know the point of what it was, right? Is to have an overarching vision and uh, you know development of more funding for food hubs that would be more than kind of a you know sprinkle around kind of amount of funding, but mm -hmm. could really accelerate some larger scale development. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll definitely I'll check with Gail Feenstra about that. Um, so I know since we we didn't have a director for about a year, I wonder if that, as Glenda said, that might have fallen off the radar. So I'll definitely talk to Gail and make sure if we're supposed to be on a board that we have a seat and we have a person designated for that. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Cause they're, uh, they're filling it in the deadline past uh, January 19th. Oh, but I think, I think for you all, it'd be okay. Anyway, okay. that's what the meetings are for, huh? Yeah, exactly. I can and, check and just so um, you know, some of that funding that Ruth mentioned, the, the, the food business support center, that yeah. we've got 35 million, although that's scattered between four states, that definitely will be focusing on food hubs amongst other infrastructure. And, and actually uh, CDFA just got $38 million for their uh, resilient food systems initiative. 
And that money is just California, 38 million. And it is supposed to target facilities, equipment, uh, infrastructure, such as food hubs. So we do have okay. some significant funding there as well. Well, maybe the Food Hub Advisory Board would, would deal with that funding, if not the uh, $15 million it was secured before. So. so get yourself on that thing, Bruce. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'm going to try, try and figure out how to mute myself. I keep hitting the wrong thing. So apologies if it takes me a while. Well, one of the exciting things that has been going on around Food Hubs, which is critical here, um, our Nutrition Policy Institute did an analysis of what the Riverside Unified School District has done to serve as a food hub. And, and, and they've done an amazing job in Sacramento Central Kitchen and several other places in the state are learning from that and, and they're all sharing info. And Grant up in Sonoma County, Redwood uh, Food Bank, um, is has actually been doing a lot of that kind of service too. And I, I really see a lot of synergy with the food banks there. We actually have a project at our South Coast Rec right now any acreage there that we're not utilizing for research projects. A.G. Kawamura has an agreement with the local food bank. He's growing food on our property hmm. on, on acres we're not using. I mean, research still is first priority. But if we're not using it specifically for a research project, he comes in and does short-term growing and gets that all into the food bank. And, and that's something we're trying to right. replicate more places too. Very good. The Riverside model is very interesting for institutional procurement because I, my understanding is their farm is actually part of their school district. Hmm. And it just bypasses a whole suite of barriers of procurement policies, food safety, third party audits, and all these kinds of things. Um, and I think that's an interesting, interesting thing to look at. I don't think it's possible everywhere, but um, we've had lots of conversations in Fresno about farm to school because we have such a large school district that is it's sort of a factory assembly line to get meals out to um all of the school districts every day and it's aggregation of small farm produce is hard and and so when we looked at their procurement policies um the riverside model seemed like an interesting way to actually not have to deal with the the requirements to to like um get contracts from three different uh fitters and and having certain levels of minimum levels and things like that. Um, so I think that's an interesting thing to look at. Yeah, I'll just on that point, um, so we, our organization works with Fresno, but mm -hmm. we also work closely with LAUSD and have since 2012. And and you, LAUSD, uh, we connected them with some farm to school advisors and they're linking up with the Riverside Food Up. Mm -hmm. So that's an extension of a success story there, like being that's having a, a regional influence, yeah. I actually do not know how to un to mute my microphone, so I'm really sorry for the background noise. <laughs> I'm going to figure it out. Actually, Sarah, I might try to have the Sarah team go down and visit Southern California uh, fairly soon. And uh, we looked at visiting some of those places in Riverside. Um, so I think um, one way to really expand the statewide outreach and the connection with the counties is to actually travel a little bit more. Um, and so I'm excited about that as well. Does anyone have to, can I ask a question? <laughs> um, does anybody, if anyone have suggestions for expanding the small grants program? I'm gonna be talking to the a &R development services, but um, I guess if there are any suggestions for uh, fundraising opportunities, I'd, I'd be very interested to hear any any advice on that. Ruth, one thing to pursue, there is an organization called Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Funders. Mm -hmm. it's, it's grant making organizations. Mm -hmm. And some of the members of that are relatively small family foundations and others. You know, it hadn't occurred to me till you just asked that. But if if that type of grant is what they're interested in, it may be that we could make some partnerships that would reduce administrative overhead for us and them. 
Mm -hmm. So maybe there's some partnerships to be had in something like that. They've got a brand new CEO who uh, I'm trying, I'm reaching out to, to say hi to, because they're the mm. one I had with for years just left. And Ashley, you probably know them, aren't you guys? Are you I, kn I know them, but um, I don't know the new people. And that's a great idea, Glenda. I think that's- Yeah, because some of these small family foundations, they just get chewed alive with admin overhead for- And even some of the bigger ones, I think might be interested. So, and and no matter what, they should definitely know about everything you're doing uh, with Syrup. And so I think that's a great suggestion. It's Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Funders, is that correct? Funders group. So yeah. it's kind of a, a group. I don't know if they're their own group, but they're under the Environmental Grant Makers Association, or at least they used to be. And it's got funders come around together. Mm -hmm. They gather around uh, shared interest topics. And so there's mm -hmm. one around food mm -hmm. and sustainable food systems. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. very much aligned and collaborate with environmental grant makers. And some of them belong to both. Yeah. I was okay. a member when I was yeah. USDA because we were doing grants. And they never took me off their mailing list, so I still get all their info, which I'm quite thrilled about. <laughs> That's great. Well, I'll definitely I'll look at, I'll look at that for sure. I can send you contacts and info on them. Okay. Okay, great. Jaron, what are you saying in chat? I can't see it. Let's see. Sorry oh, about that. No, that's great. Food systems is a component of some of the surf, the California Economic Resiliency Fund. Uh, effort for some regions. Actually, Jaron, we're pushing that food uh, systems, regional food systems, local food is an economic development opportunity in every region. So help me with that. <laughs> That's great. That's really great. And, and I'll tell you from kind of on the inside, some of them are very easy when it's in the natural resource industries up here. Mm -hmm. Some of them are harder, like healthcare, of what we can kind of do for pre-development activities. And ag's been more in the, the harder opportunity of what we can do. So we need ideas and we need things to do pre-development on, figure out how we can get a larger grant and bring it in because we have all kinds of uh, regenerative ag farms coming up. It's a huge component to ag tourism and uh, you know, kind of pasture to plate. And I think there's a lot of opportunities with what counties and economic development districts are thinking. So mm -hmm. definitely will and any support I can provide, happy to help. Great, thank you. Hey Ruth, this is Jack Hansen calling from up in Lassen County. Uh, do you have a uh, specific uh, gross income level in mind for a small farm? Do you have a specific definition or not? Well, there's the USDA definition, which right, is- Right, yeah. Is that what yeah, so, uh, yeah, but um, historically the small farms team has used more of a working definition of farms that are not trying to compete with the national or international wholesale markets on the basis of low price, large volume. So farms that are trying to find another niche. I kind of think it's better to have a flexible, flexible definition like yep. that. So that's a good. Yeah. And of course, I'm sure you're aware that most commodity groups obviously have sustainability initiatives, mm -hmm. some with time frames uh, and and so on involved. And in, uh, like in the beef industry, obviously we've got the global roundtable. And it was interesting. Your three pillars are exactly the three pillars, obviously, that we created. And, and, and created about 17 years ago. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of similarities in that, but thank you. Yeah. Good, I, I think it's a good job, good program. Thank you, I appreciate that. Other questions for Ruth or anything else you wanna share concerning Sarah? I mean, if not, I'm happy to give you some time back and I'm sure Ruth will be happy to interact with any of you as needed. Um, yeah, really look forward to following your progress, Ruth. And we, Sustainable Conservation will probably reach out to you. We'd love to collaborate on this whole regulatory burden on small farms, yeah. as you know, and we're kind of digging back into that. So we'll be reaching out. Great. That sounds great. Definitely feel free to get in touch. I I love talking about that. So yeah, I don't, I don't, it's not like, seems like it wouldn't be the most exciting thing, but it's just, it hits everywhere. So it's important. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I think I'll jump off now with this if there's not any other questions. Nice yeah. job, Ruth. Thank you, Ruth. Well done. Yeah, Great thank work. you, Ruth. Appreciate and, it. And um, I'm going to let us <clears throat> shut down a few minutes early, too, because I have to uh, 
trundle slowly outside to the parking lot for the golf cart to pick me up. I'm off to a different building here at Silomar to speak on a panel about the farm bill. Not that many of us know exactly what's going on on the farm bill, other than it's been postponed yet again. But uh, hopefully um, we'll get some some interesting things. They're having a big town hall forum here at the Silomar at Eco Farm on the farm bill. That's right. Great. Yeah, it's going to be. It's, I think it's going to be interesting because there's a there's a lot of questions and you know the the, the groups here really want reform in the farm bill, and uh, I'm actually kind of curious about how it's going to look because um, I I actually offered up my I have I have my entire PhD dissertation in three slides because my dissertation was all about analyzing why we couldn't get more sustainable programming in the farm bill and it's largely because a lot of the groups just won't work together mm. <laughs> they undercut each other and, and they don't communicate and unrealistic expectations and etc 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 and so i don't know how popular i'm going to be after the end of this session <laughs> but they're asking me what can we do to be better and i'm going to say you need to change tactics you need to start being more open to collaboration and you true believers have got to sometimes be willing to work with the folks who are only in it for what's in it for them. Uh, yeah. you got to find that 70, 80 percent where you can agree and not refuse to work with people that don't agree with you 100 percent. I have a feeling I'm not going to be very popular later this evening, but so be it. <laughs> <laughs> and Grant, uh, text me and we'll find a time to talk. You got it. Thanks, okay. man. Great program today. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Again. Very good. Yeah. Everybody See have you. a great yeah. weekend. You too. Bye. Bye.